The following content is provided by MIT OpenCourseWare under a Creative Commons license. Additional information about our license and MIT OpenCourseWare in general is available at ocw.mit.edu. Welcome to the CDD Forum, Sensing Place, Photography is Inquiry. Uh, we have today with us Martin Krieger, who's a professor of urban planning at uh, California and who, interestingly enough, started out in physics and got his PhD in physics before moving to planning. Uh, and ask him how he made, that was an interesting shift to, to make that uh, connection between the understanding of, of physics and uh, issues surrounding planning. I first encountered his work in the pages of Landscape Architecture magazine in a wonderful article called What's Wrong with Plastic Trees? which was quite provocative and is the title of a re more recent book. So I think uh, you'll all be set for quite a ride here, a uh, presentation of <laughs> looking at the city uh, using photography and uh, as a form of research. And Mark Schuster will be giving a few comments after uh, Mark Krieger's presentation. So, welcome. Before um, I turn this over to Martin, I'd like to announce that Leslie Tuttle will be speaking next Monday at 6 o'clock on uh, title? Leaving Tradition Behind. Leaving Tradition Behind, which is about uh, several generations of Muslim Kurdish women in, and their families in Turkey and the migration of the children and grandchildren uh, from the village to cities and then on to London. So please join us uh, next Monday. Mm -hmm. Martin? Thank you very much, Anne. Um, I'll explain the title, which has lots of sort of $100 words in it, like ambiences and choreographies and sensorium, uh, as I go along. Um, first of all, it's really very lovely to be back in 10485 after having uh, left it about 20 years ago, and or 22 years ago, and see some of my old friends here and new people and people who were once uh, sort of young and now are less young, as they say, <laughs> and some of us who are middle-aged and now older. Um, so it's really nice. And MIT has really quite a distinguished tradition in photography, as you're probably aware of. Um, Minor White taught here in the 60s, I believe, and uh, where Jerry Wiesner some, uh, thought that somehow the arts could humanize the engineers. I'm not sure if that's, uh, in fact, the way to do it, but it certainly was good to have uh, Minor White teaching here. Uh, and if you, the, my favorite thing about MIT is that if you go in E51 and E53 on the third floor, at least 20 years ago, there were photographs by Bernice Abbott of uh, various physics experiments. Are they still there? In the president's office. They're spectacular images, and I recommend them highly to you. Uh, they're used for the Physical Sciences Study Committee. Uh, she was commissioned to do that. And if you don't know who Bernice Abbott is, she'll come up later. Um, and I'm also grateful, in some sense, for having left MIT and gone Hollywood, so to speak, as you'll see. I teach at the University of Southern California, and as I was saying before, half our faculty would wish, uh, if you ask them what they really want to do, they really want to direct. Uh, in any case, uh, I thought inquiry and sensing is a perfect theme, because in fact, that's what I'm up to. Let me give you a preview of what I'll be saying. Uh, I gather questions should be deferred to later on so that the recording can go smoothly, but uh, I'll be glad to take on any questions. Normally I take them during. Uh, this work on photography, I'll argue, is a natural continuation of my other work. And what gave me the courage to pursue it, besides getting older, was the work of Diderot in the French Encyclopedia of 1760, Charles Marville's work of 1860, where he photographed Paris before it was eviscerated by Baron Haussmann, and Eugene Ajet's photographs of Paris at around 1910, 1920, uh, as it slowly but wasn't modernizing yet. Uh, my insight was that I didn't have to be an artistic photographer to do the work, but I could learn an enormous amount from the artists and the craftsmen in the field. 
uh, in other words, I didn't have to worry about whether I was going to be a great photographer, but I could learn tremendous amounts from the techniques and styles and methods. And if someone said to me, you're imitating uh, Diderot, I would say, thank God. In other words, I'm not worried about being original, which for an artist is crucial. I have other concerns. Uh, there are several themes that come up in my work. One is I'm interested in repetition. I'm interested in phenomena that happen lots and lots and lots of times, not unique events. As you'll see, for example, I have photographed about 800 storefront churches in Los Angeles. Each one of them is special, but in their toto, there's a story to be told, which I think is rather interesting. I'm interested in ordinary things, not extraordinary things, things that happen every day. It doesn't mean you pay attention to them every day, but they're around. In, when people talk about, in, uh, people who do uh, make motion pictures, and they talk about the background town, uh, sound of a room, because no room is silent. There's always things going on, the heat, ventilation, air conditioning, the out, outside sound of the traffic. The word they use is ambience, A-M-B-I-E-N-C-E, -E, or room tone. And so I'm interested, as you'll see, not only in what's ordinary visually, but what's ordinary sonically or orally. I also use the word choreography, and what I mean by that is the idea that people's motions, collective motions, are coordinated. A factory depends on people working together. Because if you don't do your part, the next guy can't do theirs. And so one of the things I want to do is figure out how in the world to convey that choreography. Which, by the way, is very difficult to do visually. And there are whole books devoted to how do you make visual representations of dance. You know, what are the right kind of photographs? What's the style to use and so forth? And there's people who worry about this a good deal in the dance business. The other theme is what I call the sensorium. What I mean is, what is the experience of a place like? How do you record it? How do you record it archivally so that 50 or 100 years ago, 50 or 100 years from now, you have some idea of what it was, you know, what it felt like? Uh, probably we know the most about cities and what they were like from novels and visual, uh, I mean, verbal descriptions, certainly smells, sounds, and so forth. And can we do, and of course, you know, not everybody can be Flaubert, but can we do interesting work without being great writers? And that's an interesting question. My second big thing besides the themes of repetition and the sensorium is that I take technology, and I'll explain what I mean, as the transcendental condition, to use a Kantian phrase, for the work. In other words, it sets up the conditions for doing the work. So that if I use a wide angle lens or a certain kind of color film, some things are possible, some things are not possible. You can always push the envelope, but you're always pushing an envelope given what's possible within a range. All right? Um, and, uh, and that comes to me now that I'm beginning an oral documentation project where my knowledge of uh, sound recording is very elementary compared to what I knew about photography when I started, and I'm just encountering that. And the third theme in my work is what I call it's being social science informed. Uh, one of the problems of visual materials in the modern university is that if it ends up in the humanities' hands, it can be like what the art historians do, which are careful description and, and careful using of instances. But the social scientists in general do reductionist bits on it. They're always trying to say, well, you just how do you code the images or you, you know, if the anthropologists are so worried about the fact that visual anthropology is biased and prejudiced in various ways, you wonder why they do it at all. Um, and, and I want to talk about a way of thinking about this that I find valuable, that, doesn't, that allows me to do my work and feel like I am being social scientific without being reductionist. And what I mean by reductionist is taking, giving photographs or images less cre credence than verbal summaries thereof. All right. And remember, we have a tremendous literature on nowadays of how Im visual images deceive us. And of course, historically, uh, one of the great fields of intellectual inquiry was rhetoric. And was all, that was also about how verbal stuff deceive us. So why do people not talk? Why do people still make images? There's a reason, I think. I don't think we have to be uh, uh, paralyzed. 
All right, that's the general themes I'm going to be talking about. Um, I am, my, almost all my work can be described as, by the way, I will get to images shortly, so don't give up hope. Um, almost all my work can be described as analytic description, whether it be of math, of physics, of planning and design. I want to show the world to people who do it in such a way that it's recognizable to them, but it's analytically described in a small number of categories and a collected leaked set of ideas. So that, for example, I wrote a book called uh, On the Physicist's Toolkit, and the idea was, could I set a small number of basic ideas that dominate how people do analysis or basic models? And all I can ask from the scientist is, yes, yeah, so that sounds right. Yeah. So what? Then I've won the game. Why? Because I found a representation that they find believable. Now you could say, well, why should you give them authority about you know, what physics is? Well, my idea is that if I can reproduce the world that they know and they recognize it, I've done pretty well. And the reason I say all these skeptical remarks is because I've encountered them over the years, uh, and it's the bread and butter of social scientists and, and academics to be skeptical. Uh, I could do it, I guess, as well as anybody, but it's not what my bread and butter is. Um, and what I want to do is give analytic description for the purposes here of what I call the drama of ordinary life, whether it be worship in a Pentecostal church, how factories are organized and how people work together. Uh, and also I want to talk how the built environment is molded mold and is molded by us. So for example, uh, most recently, uh, we have uh, a general, count, LA County General Hospital, which I think has been featured on TV shows for one of the TV series, but it's county is famous. It's a place you go to get lots of experience with gunshot wounds and so forth. And it's being closed down and a new hospital is being built because of earthquake and politics. And so I recently got permission and went top to bottom photographing the hospital and people working there. Not any of the patients, because that would have been impossible. Because it'd be interesting to ask, how is the design of the place affect the coordination of people in it? And of course, lot, you could do lots of field work, but one of the possibilities is just to do the photographs. And I spent about three or four days literally going through the hospital with a guide. Now, one question you might ask is, why photographs? Why you are doing photographs when most of your career is writing fairly analytic books? I wrote four books on mathematical modeling, including quite technical stuff on mathematics, three books on planning and design theory, where I use religion and phenomenology. Where do I get warrant to do this? Well, there are three reasons. One, I've had a long-standing interest in this and actually wrote about it. And in graduate school, for reasons which I can't recall, I ended up taking a course on social science uses of photography from a guy named Paul Byers, who was Margaret Mead's photographer. And Margaret Mead was very big on photographs, visual materials in social science. Second, what do you do after you write your big book in your 50s? Here I am, I write my big book. Right, you know, deepest, most difficult, kills you, right? Knocks you dead. It's not necessarily longest, though I think it was. Uh, it's called Doing Mathematics. And I, I barely get away with writing it, in the sense that it's at the edge of what I understand. And do I want to write another one? And it's very interesting. I realized that I had nothing more to say. Or I mean, I could have more to say, but it wouldn't be much of an improvement. So in some sense, I had room in my research portfolio. And thirdly, we, when I moved, we moved into a new building uh, five, six, seven years ago, and it had a room called a gallery. And I was put on the committee to figure out what to put in the gallery. Well, you know what committees do, uh, nothing. So um, I just figured out, I asked them, well, I can put up a show of this stuff and that stuff. And so I became, quotes, curator, though I didn't know that. I just putting up, kept putting up shows. And my secret was I didn't ask for much money from my dean. So no one controlled it. You know, the shows kept going up. They may have been a little cheesy in how they, things were stuck on the wall. The posters didn't look gorgeous. But there was a show, three shows a year, and it's been going on for five, six years. And eventually, everybody thinks it's part of the furniture, which is what I've done. Um, so what I did was about eight, nine years ago, I started gingerly and started taking photographs. And what made it work was, and this is the thing that seems to me the deep insight, a city is an archive of its past. Nothing goes away virtually. The physical infra the built infrastructure does not go away. You build it for 50 years, it lasts much longer in general. Everybody says everything gets knocked down in Los Angeles. That's not true. It just isn't true. Everything, you know, 
essentially, for whatever reason, almost nothing gets knocked down compared to what gets renovated, repainted, redone. Um, uh, I've been walking around Boston all day today, and what's really impressive is how much that's going on in, in, in Boston. I mean, much more than in LA, but you have more old infrastructure you know, and old buildings and so forth, and I guess a, a deep need for condos. Uh, and so if you go look at a city visually, you will see the historical layers right then and there. So it's enormously rich. In other words, it's sort of like doing um, uh, archaeology, but you don't have to dig very much. And you know there's a field called industrial archaeology where they, you know, they try to figure out how a factory worked 100 years ago. Well, this is much like that, except lots of things are just there on the surface, and it's quite remarkable. And I'll get to some examples. And also, I could get away with doing this photography. For whatever reason, I was not obtrusive. I go there and I look like, and someone said, oh, there's that old man with a camera. And that's wonderful because that means they don't care about you. They don't think you're up to anything harmful for the most part. I would go in and I'd say to a factory owner, uh, could, I'm a professor from USC, I'm interested in developing an archive of industry in Los Angeles, uh, it's for the libraries. And about one third of the time they say yes. Well, you know, if you hit, have a hit rate of one third or one fifth, you're in business. Because all you have to do is ask five people to get one yes. Of course, that's not true probabilistically, but there's something else. Uh, but the point is that the hit rates are fairly high. The, the major thing you have to realize is most owners are never there until 11 o'clock in the morning. The owner's not here is the usual line if you go early. What owners are doing before 11 is something else. Um, the other thing you have to realize is that because someone says no, you just go to the next place. You never ever worry about the people who say no. You can say, well, isn't, aren't you, don't you have a bias sample? The answer, I'm sure, is yes. But if I have enough of them, I figure the biases will get worked through. I'm sure the places where they're torturing people to work will not let me photograph, but I do not believe there are very many of them, statistically. Because the places where they let me photograph do not look like heaven. Um, and the other thing that helps is that I'm dogged. I recommend it highly. I would go out every morning, three, four days a week, and photograph. When I was photographing churches, I would go up and down the streets of Los Angeles and systematically go up and down the streets. You know, and you don't run out of them, and some days you have, you hit pay dirt, and some day you don't, but your secret is you keep doing it. And if you keep doing it, you'll beat everybody. And if you don't worry about your photographs being perfect, but making sure you just get decent images and you keep doing it so you're not sitting there agonizing, you know, and adjusting your this and that, you get it done. Um, and there are costs to my technique, but the advantage is it gets done, and I'm big on that. Nothing is worth doing if you're not going to do it, at least so I believe. Anyway, let me t show you some of the work I've worked on. Um, and so what happened is that I had the the doggedness, I had the fortune of not, you know, I mean, some people, I mean, there's a guy named Ken Heyman who is six foot something, big guy, he can fit into any corner, he does, never seems to take up space, you know, probably twice my size. Other people, you know, just don't have the style or something, I have no idea why I get away with it. Um, I'm polite and so forth, but maybe anyone can do it. I recommend it highly to try. Uh, Anyway, there are several important themes in the work I've done. I started out, actually, the first thing I started doing is in Beverly Hills, where I live, the largest form of urban renewal in Beverly Hills is done by Persian immigrants who buy a property, knock it down, and put up what I call a Persian palace. A Persian palace is a, a Western design that's, that's been translated to Tehran, it's a modern section, and then when they come here, they want to put some version of it up. It always has lots of balconies, lots of columns. It has a window over the front, which is sometimes with you know, fancy glass. It fills up the envelope. It's a, a mansionette, and there are lots of them. Now, Beverly Hills has, is undistinguished architecture. 
So people say, oh, it's destroying our, uh, our, the quality of our architecture. And I consider that one of the uh, canards of the lowest sort. Um, the quality of architecture for the price of the house is probably lower than any place in the world. Um, it's not that it's bad, it's just undistinguished. It's not architecture, it's some sort of, you know, you wanted a George, some years Georgian was popular. All right. So I started photographing the Persian palaces, as I called them, and I didn't like doing it after a while. I realized this is just too funny. I was making fun of people at some level, and I didn't like that. Um, and then I noticed, I did some other things, and let me give you some examples. Um, let's see. Yes, this is nail parlors. Um, I'm convinced that in California and Los Angeles, more money is spent on keeping uh, women's nails in shape than the budgets of most small countries. The nail parlors are ubiquitous. They reflect the fact that, and it, but it's not just that there's a demand, there's a supply. You know who the, the nail par the people who do the nail parlors, they're mostly Vietnamese uh, immigrants. Star, uh, of late, I mean, I'm sure it's changing, who could get into this field. For some reason, they started and they get into it. And nail parlors are, are everywhere. I don't know if that's true here, but where I am, they're everywhere. And so I started noticing them. I and once you start noticing a few, you start seeing them everywhere. And that's the basic phenomenon in most of my work. I notice something, and then when I open up my eyes, I just don't notice one, I notice hundreds. That's the deepest thing. So for example, um, yes, these are houses, storefront houses of worship. Not all of them are storefront houses of worship. This is uh, First Church of the Rasta, for example, here. Uh, all right, and this is not really a, a, a church. I mean, it's a market, actually. Uh, but the Jefferson Boulevard, in fact, once had plastic trees on it. Uh, it's on the, it's, and, let me just show you a typical, these are not the most standard of the ones. Let me just see if I can find one. Yeah, this is a, you know, a converted um, movie theater and so forth. There are loads of them. And then I can show you some more um, in a moment. Yes, another thing is I started noticing, uh, Los Angeles, as you probably know, has one of the largest um, municipal utilities in the United States, if not the largest, the Department of Water and Power of Chinatown fame. And it has everywhere, it's a monopoly. It was meant as a monopoly. Um, it essentially scared out and bought out all the competitors in Los Angeles uh, so it could run the grid itself. And, it, and so it has these electrical distribution stations which are places which take the voltage from a high voltage to say 4,500 volts. And then it's distributed around and lowered for your home use, all right? And uh, so it turns out there are 100 and, about 135 to 150 of these stations, and so I visited them all, all right? Once I started noticing them, you see, and these are, these are the first 20, all right? And you know, like this one's a palace here. Can you see my, if I do that, you see, yes, all right? Some of them are, are undistinguished. Some of them, are, this one looks different because it was a different company that built it. And it was LA Gas and Electric, and uh, in 1937, they were forced to sell out. Um, but many of them look like these monument, they're monumental structures, okay? And what happened is, I started noticing them, and I was fortunate. This was before 9-11, I could get a list of them all from the Department of Water and Power. I'm sure after 9-11, I could not have gotten it. And, but I was fortunate the guy liked me, so he was willing to let me see it informally, the list. Um, and so, I could, they're all on the street, they're not hidden, but to have a nice, convenient list. And so that involved literally visiting all over Los Angeles, because they have to be in every neighborhood, because the job is to apply power. So in some sense, if you visit every one of these, you visited almost every section of the city of necessity, which is sort of nice. Um, I also did things like, for example, um, let's see, where is it? Yes. 
Uh, this is not very clear, unfortunately, but what I did was I, w I started photographing industrial streetscapes. In other words, I would find industrial streets in Los Angeles and literally photograph every building on the street. Okay? And this is one street in, um, on uh, Clarence Street, actually, which is on the east side of the river in the flats. And over here, this market is where some guys got killed uh, soon before. And people are always worried about my well-being, but I tell them no one, no one commits murder at 9 in the morning on a weekday. You know, there's no one out to do it. You know, the crooks are not there. But uh, so this is one area where I went, you know, it, it's an industrial area. And, I, and the idea was to somehow capture that industrial streetscape for future use. Um, Now, what, what informs all this work? The idea is repetition, that there's not just one of them, but they're multiple. And they're multiple for good reasons. There are multiple of these departments of water and power spectral distribution stations because they have natural sizes, roughly. You can't make, you know, you, you don't want to, it's sort of the solving a uh, networking problem where you want to break it down to smaller units, but you don't want too much centralization. You have the right level of centralization and for the power needs. Uh, you have too many at the edges of Los Angeles, at the edges of Los Angeles' uh, boundaries. Why? Because they, Los Angeles is a place that's been in the business of annexation for 100 years. And so people from the Department of Water Power figure, well, my, we might annex there, so we might as well put it closer to the edge. We stopped annexing at some point, but that's why they're there. Uh, and, uh, for example, the, um, the storefront houses of worship, which I visited, and I have a, a, about 800 of them, and the secret of that, how do you get so many? You just go up and down streets, and you keep doing it until you get sick of it. And, you know, if your stomach is good, you keep doing it for a few months. And the trick there is the following. By the way, do everybody know that today, uh, this month is the 100th anniversary of Pentecostalism? Uh, here's what happens. In 1906 in Los Angeles, at the Azusa Street Mission, which is now in uh, what we call, uh, Little Tokyo, there was a, people started speaking in tongues. Now it turns out people had been speaking in tongues before this, well before this, in other parts of the United States and the world. But this turns out to be the archetypal moment from which it spreads in April 1906. And it's a source for what we call modern Pentecostalism. So Los Angeles is the Jerusalem of Pentecostalism. And, this, and then the other thing that's very important is the great migrations up north from the south to the north, which brings African Americans and cer on certain routes and so forth. The other thing that's crucial about the um, storefront churches, which is important to understand, is where are they located? They're always located in storefronts, right? Well, people don't build storefronts for churches. They don't pay enough rent. They built them because if you had um, trolley lines, people would get off the trolley lines and do some shopping on their way home or to and from. Well, the trolley lines eventually go. The storefronts are still there. Turns out, and the, the neighborhood doesn't do too well. So these are the people who can afford, you know, who can rent them. And there's obviously nothing better you can do with them. So you have large numbers of storefront churches. Uh, most storefront churches are small, you know, 50 to 100 at most members. The mega churches are entirely different business. Uh, I don't know what happens here, but mega churches nowadays are occupying, in, you find them in industrial parks in Los Angeles. You know, they take over a building and suitably, you know, uh, relig religi sac sacralize it. But remember, it's still a tilt up. And so there's, an itch, there's a long story, and what I've done with that, for example, uh, is I try to look at the symbolic content. I look at the quotes from scripture that they all put on their thing. It's connected. Do, you know why it's Pentecostalism? Because on Pentecost, the apostles, uh, it's, if you look at, in Acts, there's a, the apostles are start speaking in, in, uh, in tongues. And so these are the return of, so the, so Pentecostals think of themselves as essentially, um, uh, uh, as recurrences of the apostles. And that's what's so interesting about it. Um, and so you can connect the locations of the places, how they're marked, 
what do the structures look like, what kinds of symbolic contents, why they're where they are, and who's going to them in a systematic way. And so what you see is not just hundreds of storefront churches, but storefront churches in certain parts of town. And they have reasons why the storefronts are now occupied by the churches rather than by bakeries or something else. So that's, so that's the kind of thing you want to do. The same thing with the Department of Water Power. You can start telling a whole story about the history of the architecture because at one time it looks monumental. Eventually it sort of becomes boring and dull and of late it's become handsome. And it all to do with the nature of relationship of uh, the city to the people who live there. Um, in other words, these photographs give you a handle on much larger systemic factors once you start learning more about it. But of course you have to start reading the history of Pentecostalism or start understanding uh, the kind of stuff that your students at MIT would know. Well, actually they don't know usually because they learn about microelectronics, not about power systems in general. But, you know, would learn about how electrical systems might work um, and so forth. Uh, and so that's what makes it really worth doing is that you're not just finding casual images, you're also really getting a chance to uh, plug into much larger stories. Now you can say, do you need 800? Wouldn't 600 be enough of the storefront churches? I don't know how many you need. Um, Leo Steinberg, in a very different context, he's a very distinguished art historian, said, for phenomena which people don't want to believe, no number is too few. Once they think they agree with you that this is re a real phenomenon, two or three is enough. So you owe, Because their skepticism says, oh, this can't be real, what you're saying. You know, to take pen treat Pentecostal church, these storefront churches, like you would treat Chartres, interpreting its content and so forth, oh, come on. So you have to keep doing it. When they finally get it, they don't want to see any more. So the numbers are partially just sheer persistence and survey, partially if you had to bury people in the data. So they can't, that their ordinary skepticism has to be put aside. Uh, they still can challenge you, but they can't just say, this is nonsense. Um, and so it depends, to do this kind of work, you have to have a, a, a wide range of knowledge which you have to pick up. I mean, I did not uh, come to this subject with a vast knowledge of Pentecostalism. Uh, but thank God there are very few books written on it compared to some other uh, aspects of Christianity. And so actually one could master the literature fairly quickly. Uh, that's changing slowly, but not as fast as you can keep up with it. The second uh, idea besides repetition is choreography. What I want to do there is try to understand how complex systems of people and machinery and processes work together. And that could be the flows of people and machinery and goods in a factory, or uh, the worship process in a church. In other words, it's different. It's one thing to take pictures of 800 churches' facades. It's another to go into them and start photographing or making videos. And with the one thing you want to do when you go to these churches, you stop take pictures of people having transcendent experiences, you know, the eyes rolling back, all that stuff. You know, that's, that's a sensationalism. Tom Roma specializes in that. Um, and other people do. What's really interesting is their ordinary sets of behaviors, how they're coordinated, how they work together, how in Pentecostalism in particular, which is supposed to not have an order of worship and everybody is to just feel it, everybody actually feels it, but they, they're highly disciplined by the pastor and by the rules. In other words, even though it's supposed to be spontaneous, the spontaneity is highly disciplined and controlled. Right? And so that choreography is what interests me. And how do you photograph that and how do you get documentation that is very difficult. And I've been trying to do it and I make no great claim there. My most wonderful thing that happened to me last week is I was down photographing, I was going to photograph the moss in the cracks in the concrete, because I was interested in, in what kind of plants grow in a city that are inadvertent. And there's, I haven't been able to find the literature on this, but I'm looking. And I was down at, in uh, downtown Los Angeles in the industrial area, which is sort of on the east side. And um, I didn't find that much interesting in a plant like, but there was a, there's a firm there called Brook Braid, which I've been to once before, but the guy said, we can't let you photograph now, because we're having some legal problems. Um, and it's, it's, if you drive along the freeways in Los Angeles, their building stands out, you know, it's 
Bruck braid and Hollywood narrow fabrics. Hollywood, Hollywood brand fabrics are less fancy than Bruck braid fabrics. It's the same company, but it's two lines. So anyway, I go in this time, and the guy says, sure, uh, we're selling, you know, I'll let you this time. So his son uh, takes me around, and it's filled with all these weaving machines with wood frames. They're all 60, 70 years old, 50 years old, often with power that comes from uh, a rotating uh, armature with, with, le with leather belts. It was like... And you see all these weaving machines. Anyway, that was my favorite thing in the last two weeks. And what you're trying to understand is the flows of people. And the big thing, by the way, of getting my chance to go inside industry is I never used a flash, I never used a tripod. In other words, I didn't interrupt them. I didn't tell people to pose for me. You might be able to do much more. All right? Lee Friedlander's homage, a book of at work is all images which were, if not posed, you know, with flash and all that. But I wasn't invited in as a great photographer. And I figured that my whole idea was to get all my images before they decided to kick me out. Uh, and in the church thing, it's very interesting. I'm a Jew from Brooklyn, so you can imagine, uh, you know, I'm not exactly about to be converted. And, uh, but it turns out, uh, they're usually not interested. They'd like to know if you're religious a little bit, but they, but I could go, most of these places are quite willing to let me uh, photograph their service. Now, you know that many churches make DVDs, uh, and, and CDs of the uh, minister's uh, sermon, so you can buy it on the way out. In fact, one of the big consumers of sound equipment are small churches, you know, with, bur with CD burners and the whole shebang. Because they, you know, you can get, the, you can buy, and uh, but this is different, and they seem to be, you know, they were very, they've been very open to it. Um, one of my students is a is a Pentecostal minister, and so he he thinks the world of me, bless his soul, and so he said, sure, introduced me to the church. I I photographed, and uh, a, a ser his special service, which went on for too many hours. Um, for everybody. But it, what I'm really telling you about is about access, about those issues which are terribly, terribly important. Because you're asking people to let you, them into your most, their most sacred places, with their private lives. Um, What I'm going to go on for another about 10 minutes, so I hope that's not too, is that okay? Fine. Uh, I want to talk about two other issues, uh, technology and finally what I call social science informed photo documentation. I'm fascinated about how the technology I use for photographing makes a difference. I'll admit, I use film. I use transparency film. I do not use digital. If you want to have a long discussion about which is more archival, my attitude is film is wonderful because it sits there in the dark. And if you don't get it wet and too hot, it'll be there in 50 years. I don't know what to do about digital right now. Five years from now, maybe there'll be a better way of doing it. But I'm not going to worry. Um, but depending on the lens you use and so forth, you have, it's certain consequences. And I, happen, I discovered early on in my work that a wide angle lens is what I needed. I needed to stick my snout into the world and see it all. And that's what a wide angle lens allows you to do. You get very close, but you have a wide view. So you can see context and detail. And also, I didn't like the idea of using a telephoto lens because it made me feel like a voyeur. I mean, I'm a voyeur, clearly, so that's not the point. But it made me feel like a, a dirty voyeur. And um, so uh, I've ended up using, you know, film, which has consequences in terms of its sensitivity and color faithfulness and so forth, and wide-angle lenses, which have other consequences. And it turns out, for example, one of the things you want, which is not obvious, is you want really good lenses. Why? Not because it matters that much, except it might. Maybe there's something interesting in the corner of the image that someone in 50 years wants to see and read. Only good lenses are good in the corners. 
Most lenses are superb in the center, but to get them good in the corners, you have to pay a lot of money. And most so-called consumer quality lenses are in fact not that good once they get to the edges. They fall off fairly well, and no one cares. If you use documentation lenses, that's something else, but documentation lenses are not fast. It, there's lots of things wrong with them. And I'll give you two other examples. I, I thought I would do some video work, or at least film. And I tried first Super 8 and Kodachrome, uh, which Kodachrome lasts forever, uh, and Super 8 film is still made, and Super 8 cameras can be bought on, e bought on eBay. Um, but the problem turned out to be that editing, that I wasn't going to do the editing. It's just too much work. And it was a bit expensive. So I did go to digital video. And digital video is easy to edit. iMovie does a fine job. Uh, but of course, using video is really hard. And I think it's too hard for me, to be honest. But the, there, the technology of digital made it possible for me to use it. My third example is my current project. About four months ago, our provost, I don't, I don't know if MIT has this, but our provost sends out initiatives for new ways of encouraging collaboration, presumably bringing in more research grants and making the university better. Um, and they come out fairly often. And most of the time should be ignored, from my point of view, because they're just distracting. But there was one about the arts and the humanities, and I was invited to the meeting about it, and I said, oh, I, this I need like a, a hole in the head. But somehow, if getting invited means I usually say yes. So it turns out I mentioned at this meeting that I tried using audio and I can't make it, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. And that's because um, even using, the, I just wasn't, it wasn't, the audio, my recording was not very good. I was using mini disc and so forth, but it wasn't very good. And it turns out someone comes up to me at the break who is Mr. THX, the guy who invented THX, Mr. 5.1 Sound, a guy named Tom Holman, who's a, a guru of this sort. He's a professor of film sound at USC. And he says, here's, I, I can help you. And a few days later, he sends me a memo. Here's what you need. Here's what, how to do it. Um, and so that's my next big project. And why am I going to do it? Because first of all, I have Tom behind me. So he'll tell me what to do technically. And that involves things like advice, which microphone to buy. There are many more microphones than lenses. And I don't understand it all very well. So he recommends a $5,000 pair. And you know, what am I going to say? Uh, you know, you go and you get that. And then a certain kind of recorder, you know, and you try to get a grant. To, as he said, you have to shake the trees to get the money. But I don't mind shaking trees, and I got some money. Second of all, what is my goal? My goal is to do accurate and archivable audio. Accurate, which means that people in 50 years from now can know how to reproduce it so it sounds right. The right volume levels, the right spatial things. In other words, you have to give it metadata and calibration, and that's never done in audio recording. In the sound recording, the sound libraries of the studios often do not identify the source of it because they want you to think generically. In other words, if this sound is taken in Los Angeles, maybe you can use it in Hong Kong anyway for Hong, you know, Hong Kong sound. And so, in fact, they hide the information deliberately. And most people who do sound art are not concerned about accuracy because they're using the sound to do certain kinds of wonderful things. So the idea of accuracy, in fact, turns out, according to Tom and what I've been able to find, not very imp given much energy. Even the people who worry about hi-fi don't really care because they're, caring, they're not really concerned about accuracy. They're, they're, interested in a certain semblance of a certain sort. Um, and the other thing is archivable. What way of storing it will be around for 100 years? And how do you store it the best way? You know, and what's the, you know, you have, and these are technical issues, but they're generally not addressed, it turns out. It turns out, I didn't know it how much it's not turned out, but you know, it's required of figuring this out. And the idea that we've decided is we want to give people a sense of being there, whatever the sounds are, but we're not going to worry about, uh, Tom has something called 10.2 sound, which is double 5.1, and involves, don't worry, it's DARPA pays for it. Um, you know, they're interested in simulating 
warfare and whatnot, and so there's people in the engineering school who worry about this. Uh, and, uh, and I've been in rooms with this 10.2 sound, it's really quite spectacular. Uh, and the way I've described this, that work, I want to record ambience, as the technical term in the cinema is called, the sounds you don't listen to. Because they're just there, you don't pay attention to them. Uh, street noise, apartment noise from your neighbors, uh, impure sounds, for example, people talking over something else, uh, boring long passages. Because life is lots of boring long passages of sound, and most people say, all right, 30 seconds, that's enough. But the whole idea of a boring long passage is very important as experienced. So that's the kind of stuff I'm up to. And I don't know what I'm doing, by the way. In the sense, this is my specs. I've, done, I've rented equipment and tried it out, so I know I can do it. But ask me in, a, in six months when I've done it, because I don't believe in promising, um, ex, you know, other than trying hard. Uh, for those who are interested, a fisheye lens has a very similar um, acceptance as a cardioid microphone. In other words, the fisheye lens, the way it sees the world, is very much like the cardio cardioid microphone hears the world. So you might even use the image to give some idea of what you're hearing. And what you have to do is you have to be calibrated, which means you have to calibrate the process so you know what's, what those bits on the CD should be correspond to. And it has to be slated, to use the term of art from cinema, and that means that it has to have the metadata built in. And what I, and finally, you have to use the right kind of microphones. If you go look at a microphone catalog, microphones are sort of um, like getting plastic surgery. It's not that you want to get the same look, you want to sound, look a certain way, or sound a certain way, and they have all sorts of interesting um, in, nonlinearities in effect. And a truly linear microphone is not necessarily what people want for most recording, it turns out. So you have to get the right kinds of microphones with high degrees of coding and skill. And what I call is anti-Velveeta. Velveeta is a film which soups up color and um, saturation enormously. And you want the reverse of that. You want a natural color. And by the way, there are very few films that you can buy which have anything close to natural color. Very few. Professional, unprofessional, almost all of them are souped one way or the other for various purposes. And even then, it's very hard to get anything close to natural color. And I could go on about you know, which kind of recording system. For those who care, you use mid-side technique, and I can explain later. All right. So my point is that I'm getting involved in a field where the technology is much less obvious to me, much more apparent about the choices I make, and much more crucial to what I do if I want to get something accurate and archival. And that's a discovery I made. I mean, I knew I, if I used really good lenses, I'd be OK. I mean, I didn't, you know, I figured that's about all I can hope for. But this is much harder. Finally, I want to say something about what I call social science informed photo documentation. Um, if you read the literature on visual documentation, for example, um, what's the journal? Uh, from the Society of Visual, An Visual Anthropology Review, or uh, what's the sociological one called? I forgot, but there's one the sociologist run. Or the literature on visual stuff. There's, as I said, there's all the skepticism, and there's all this stuff about methodology, you know, the right qualitative methods. And if anyone's had to teach a qualitative methods course and try to use visual images, I mean, after you read the, the articles on qualitative methods about visual images, I don't know why anybody would use them. You know, it sort of takes all the pleasure out of it. And um, so what I say is that my topics and understanding of how these systems work comes out of my understanding of how cities work or how industrial processes work. I'm fortunate that I have a historian of uh, uh, Greg Heiss, who's my neighbor, my next to my office, and he's been writing about the history of industry in Los Angeles and more generally the history of industry in cities. And so I have this expert to consult with. I, you know, I walk in and say, look what I found, and he'll tell me what it means. Um, and what I say, in other words, is that I'm not, I don't have a methodology, but I have a well-informed mode of inquiry with lots and lots of information. So if I'm writing about, uh, as I told you before, about the storefront churches, my secret is that I'm not just taking, telling you cute remarks, but it's based on the scholarly literature. And the people who know about storefront churches will know that I'm not that stupid about it. 
right? I know the books, I know what the, the main arguments are, and so forth. Um, there are two other things that I think that I would like to say. I could not do this work if I didn't think there were people who did work like it, who, who are universally acknowledged. All right? Let me give you some examples. This is, uh, Diderot was the French philosopher or philosopher who, um, with D'Alembert, more or less put together the encyclopedia in 1760, the first modern encyclopedia. And you've probably seen images like this one or this one, which are wood engravings from the, the encyclopedia. Uh, you can buy a whole two volumes of Do Dover volumes of all the illustrations or many of them of uh, various industrial processes. Uh, I gather that uh, Diderot did a lot of field work himself, but he also stole the images from Leo Muir, who was doing similar work. So there's some questions about who deserves all the credit. But uh, the point is, if you go look at this, you see the details. I, this morning I was in a place called Slade Gorton and Company, which is a fish company in, uh, in uh, Newmarket Square. And if you, I was walked up the stairs, and what did I see? I saw the engravings from Diderot for making fishnets. Amazing, say to me. The second person who gives me courage. So Diderot does all of this stuff about industry. So if I want to start, describe how industry is done, I'm not alone. And Diderot is the best representative I know, because most industrial photography is either about how great the machine is or how happy or unhappy the worker is. They rarely tell you how the what's really going on, because that's not what industrial photography has been about for the most part. Uh, I have nothing against uh, how great the machine is or how unhappy or happy the worker is, but I, was, I have a different interest. All right? The other person is Charles Marville, who I mentioned before, uh, I think this is what I want, yes, uh, who was hired by um, um, Baron Haussmann to photograph Paris before and after it was eviscerated. And, and he, so he literally systematically photographed the Paris before. And you can buy books with a thousand illustrations, a thousand of his images or 500 of his images. And the best part, the book I have, is it shows you where he likely took the images from. You know, they figured out perspective, which. And the third person uh, who sort of gives me courage is, um, no, not that, I'm sorry. Oops, excuse me. is uh, Eugene Ajet, who you probably have heard about, who um, Ch John Sharkowski uh, sort of idealized the Museum of Modern Art. And this is one of his photographs of a, uh, I don't think I can make it bigger, I'll try, but I don't think, so. can I? No, it won't matter. All right. Uh, this is of a, of a store window in Paris. And he, he does, he has seven or eight different topics from store windows to parks to interiors and so forth. And he makes these images for artists to use, right? He said, I'm not, I'm not a, an artist, I'm just, I just make uh, documents. So even though Aceh is really is a great artist, I'm delighted to have someone who said that. Um, the last reason why I can do this work is because it's fundable. I've been able to get some grants to do it. Uh, that's very important, not for two reasons. One, because it's a good way of scaring off the people who would tell you you shouldn't do it. In a university, if you can get a grant from respectable people to let you do something, they pay attention. I mean, you know that. It's, it's the, it's, uh, maybe you don't know it, but if you don't, you should. And the other thing is that it buys off time that you need. You know, if you start going out f three or four days a week to photograph every morning, and remember, every hour you spend photographing usually involves two hours of cataloging time in the end. Remember, I have, I've not mentioned this, but I should finally, I'll be through in two minutes, is I have uh, um, Excel um, spreadsheets listing all my images by their topics. Every factory, every church, every street. 
I have maps of them. So there's an enormous amount of work, and to do that so they're reasonably accurate. I'm not saying about perfect, but reasonably accurate turns out to be a lot of work, especially if you're not as perfect as I am. No, you're as imperfect as I am. You know, you just have to go back and keep doing it. Uh, and sometimes you can't remember where you took the photographs. You pay for every sin, by the way. Every time you don't take good notes, you pay for it. All right, let me close. I think that the notion of inquiry and sensing place, as you call this thing, is superb description of what I'm up to. Um, what I've done is there's an outline over there that a handout for those of you who want it, which is an outline of my talk, but also includes a two-page essay, which I call Systematic Reflective Fieldwork. Because I've been challenged by people who say, well, how can I rely on your data and so forth, I've had to think a lot about how do you justify doing this kind of work to your uh, skeptical colleagues. And I'm not talking about people who just want to give you trouble. I'm talking about people who are honestly skeptical. You know, who, who, who uh, think that it's better to do a statistical analysis or who somehow say, well, what about what you're leaving out? And my job in doing this project was to figure out how to justify it. And uh, about a week ago, maybe two weeks ago, I said, well, I started looking through my notes and I, I, I figured out a story I could tell, which is what I call the systematic reflective field work. The systematic, as you can get from what I'm doing, is you keep doing lots of it in an organized way. Reflective, you try to understand what you're doing and you do lots of field work. Uh, is that enough? That's a good question, but that's what, you know, what justifies what I do. Um, I have a terrific time doing this. I'm getting away with murder. But, uh, but I think it's really valuable. What happens with all this work is it ends up in an archive in the university. That's the most important thing. We put on shows and so forth. But I, I'm not worried about making books of this or anything. That's not my purpose. My purpose is to have an archive that 60 to 100 years from now someone can use for work. That means if you want to do a good job on this, you've got to give them the kinds of indexes and information so they don't have to go crazy trying to figure out what you did. Uh, my, as I said, my next big project is going to be on or oral documentation. And uh, I've done a little, but I don't trust my knowledge of that. And we'll see what happens. Thank you. Uh, Mark Schuster, to give a uh, brief comment. Oh, that's good. You, do you need this? I guess I do. It's very good to have Marty back here in, uh, in 1045, because as you can see, the level of energy goes up instantaneously. Uh, and I remember those days with great fondness. So we're glad to have you back. Thank you. Um, so much to say uh, that was that was raised uh, in Marty's presentation and also by the, the, the two-page essay here. Um, uh, but I want to start with something that's just been on my mind. Over the last two weeks, I've had guests from France uh, visiting with me and uh, friends from many, many years ago. Uh, this was the first time in the United States for the husband. Um, the, the wife had been here uh, as a youngster. Her father worked in the embassy in, in Washington and their 17-year-old son and uh, they did a lot of observing. He's an, he's an artist, uh, amateur artist, uh, but they did a lot of observing of the cities that they were in, Boston, New York, um, Cape Ann. Uh, and uh, I wonder if you might guess what the things they were most impressed with. Right? I asked them, you know, well, what did you find most interesting in walking around? What are you doing to me? Oh, the answer is not going to be on the screen. Um, no, no, no. Uh, what, what were the most interesting things? And uh, they said, first, everyone goes around carrying a beverage in their hand. Right? Everyone goes around carrying a beverage in their hand. It's absolutely true, and it's something that we don't notice. Um, second thing, in the United States, cues work. And they were astonished when we went into a restaurant, we put our name on a list, they said, come back in a half an hour. We walked around Newburyport, half an hour we came back, they said, your table's ready. You know, and that everybody who was in front of us had been seated and everybody who was behind us hadn't yet been seated. They couldn't believe it. 
Um, and the third one was, uh, was something that uh, is a little harder to believe. They said, it, it's so clean here. You know, when we go traveling other places and we say, we go to Toronto and we say it's so clean, or we go to Disneyland and say it's so clean. Uh, well, here are French folks who came to Boston and um, New York and said it's so clean. Now, I was astonished at their power of observation, and uh, uh, it's not a power of observation that I have, and I think there's a clue in what uh, Marty has said about this repetition, to work at it and do it over and over again, um, that, really, um, th that really reminds us that it's hard work, but it's work that's worth doing. Um, Marty said toward the end, I don't have a methodology. I don't buy that for a second. You know, I think that he does have a methodology. It's an you know, unconventional methodology, perhaps. Um, but there are echoes of this methodology in things that many of us have read. Um, I, I just grabbed a couple things off my shelf. For example, um, I didn't bring the book down because it's too big, but uh, um, I remembered when Larry Vale and I taught quantitative, quali excuse me, qualitative methods, uh, and I want to disagree about that in a second. Uh, we used an essay that Kevin Lynch wrote, which was called A Walk Around the Block published in 1959. Uh, it's reproduced in Michael Southworth's collection of the published articles of Kevin Lynch. Um, and uh, it uses a methodology that's a first cousin to what Marty was talking about. Um, he would take people downtown and they would walk Newbury Street, Arlington Street, the alley between Newbury Street and, uh, and, and uh, Boylston Street, Berkeley Street. And he would ask people, you know, we are about to take a short walk don't look for anything in particular, but tell me about the things you see, hear, or smell, everything and anything you notice. Um, and he tries to capture um, in an essay then what people have told him about this little voyage around one small, simple, ordinary block uh, in Boston. It was probably more ordinary then than it is today. Um, or uh, 1980, Grady Clay, close up, how to read the American city. Uh, 1985, Alan Jacobs, Looking at Cities. Uh, John Stilgo, 1998, Outside Lies Magic. Um, or Grady Clay again in 1998, uh, Real Places, um, An Unconventional Guide to the American Landscape. Um, all of these you are using similar methodologies to what Marty is up to. Um, but, uh, and all of them are dealing with the same fundamental problem, which I think is, is Marty's problem, although he hasn't quite named it, and that is, how do I take it home with me? Right, because there's two things going on here. One thing is his experience of being out in the field, looking at these things and, and reflecting upon them, and the other is, how do I capture that and take it home and save it so that someone else can have something of the same experience? Okay, and, and I think Marty would be the first to admit that that person 50 or 60 years from now will not have the same experience, right? It'll be a different experience, um, although you can, uh, you can work as hard as you possibly can to make it an, uh, as equivalent experience as you possibly uh, can. Now, um, you, you, you spoke about qualitative methods, and I just, uh, up until that moment in your talk, um, I was having very fond memories of this course that we used to offer in the group called Qualitative Methods. Larry and I taught it once or twice. Uh, Larry taught it with Sam another time or two. Um, and it's been a long while since we've actually, uh, uh, actually taught it. Um, and perhaps the way in which we went about that is not a way that you would today accept after your experiences in the field. Um, um, but I think it's a mistake, um, and I think many of the students think it's a mistake, that we don't offer such a course uh, and that we really ought to. Um, and maybe um, you suggest uh, to us, uh, Marty, a way to do that. Uh, Stilgo, in the, in the beginning of uh, Stilgo's book, he talks in the very first few pages about how he started conventionally for, for many years with a syllabus. And eventually, he sort of threw the syllabus away and he said, what my course is about is about exploring. And so as we explore, what we're going to explore is going to change from year to year as uh, I get reactions from students as they come back from their experiences in, in the field. Um, now, I want to say something about photography, I suppose, because uh, that's what this is about, um, and, and maybe uh, speak about it a little bit more personally. I have found, as I have traveled of late, I have often left my camera at home. Uh, and the reason is because I got really tired of looking uh, at the world through a rectangular uh, frame. 
um, and spending all my time viewing it this way rather than viewing it this way. Maybe the key is the wide angle lens. Um, uh, and maybe that's what would make a difference. So I, I do take the camera along when, when um, uh, uh, I'm, I'm on a project and need uh, you know, visual evidence of one sort or another to illustrate the project. But I have found personally that it has been more restrictive for me. That makes the trick of bringing it home much more difficult. Right? Is it a journal? Is it just your memory? Is it, uh, is it some other form of recording um, that uh, allows you to bring some of this home, to catalog it, to categorize it, to, uh, you know, you're doing a lot of very traditional social science things. You're categorizing and you're sorting and you're organizing and I, I bet that ex Excel spreadsheet is organized by, uh, you can sort it by uh, the various columns which helps you sort it into different categories. That's not very far away from uh, the traditional social, social science methodology. Um, uh, and, and, and finally, I end with a, with, a, with a question. I mentioned the name Tim Samuelson to you once before, and I, you, haven't, you haven't contacted Tim. Tim, is, uh, Tim has worked with uh, uh, one of the photographers who came early in, help me remember, did, uh, did a book called Unexpected Chicago? Camille with Camille, right. Um, and they're, they're, they've been working on storefront churches in Chicago. Yes. Um, and Tim is the cultural historian for the city of Chicago and would be an interesting person to, to, to talk to about their experiences going out and photographing uh, and documenting the storefront um, churches. So there are some thoughts that I'd like to put on the table. Uh, we need to give you a chance to, to ask questions, so let's, uh, let's turn to that. And maybe I'll give this back to you, Marty, and you can... Well, I think it's better to let... Oh, let yeah. them ask us questions, questions but they're right. going to be of you, so... Right, yeah. Questions? Yeah. comment about, about the work. Is it categorized? In other words, if I look at the 800 uh, pictures of Pentecostal churches, are they categorized or are they just categorized by address and so forth? There's information about them. There's information, for example, about what their, uh, what their uh, biblical passages are. That's one thing, it, it lists the biblical passages in each. In another column lists the, the symbols that are on the church. Another column, uh, what else is there? Those are the two things I can think of immediately. If I were an architect, by the way, and the architects think differently, they would start saying, how has the building been modified? Or color. Or color. Yeah, well, no, I didn't do that. Um, and obviously, one could do much more of that work. Uh, but the architects, for example, uh, there was a woman in Houston who was concerned about the, the modifications of the buildings, which was interesting, but nothing I spent much time on, frankly. So, but the categorizations are not very deep, I must admit. Um, someone else would have to go through it all and start thinking much more deeply about what they were looking for. For example, what are your neighbors? My favorite one was next to a, to a uh, you know, a hotbed uh, motel, you know, for prostitutes. On Western uh, Avenue. Yeah. I had just a couple of other uh, comments about this. But one, one thing I'm sitting here with tremendous regret because uh, at one point in my career I was documenting bridges in Boston mm. and came across an archive uh, in a bridge house in South Boston, which were the engineering records, photographs of every bridge in Boston taken every year for about 50 years. Oh my God, how wonderful. And somebody had rescued. And I took a bunch of photos for what I was working on at the time. I probably still have those photographs, but I'm sure the rest of it, along with the bridge house, and one of the last remaining bridges of its type, were swept away. And when you were showing this, I said to myself, goodness, there are lots of archives actually like this out there that people have done based upon their particular cut at the world. Uh, Engineering, for example, all these bridges are documented for other, other reasons. Uh, and it might be quite extraordinary to begin to collect those yes. archives into a meta. No, that's exactly what's valuable about university. The thing about universities, they don't disappear too soon, too rapidly. And they don't throw out archives too often. And that's what their big advantage is, you know, they're long standing institutions. And, uh, you know, libraries are like that too. But there are very few places that would do that. You know, most corporations uh, eventually with their corporate, uh, what's, 
um, the Huntington Library just got the corporate archives of got something of the Southern California Edison with photographs, just infinite amounts of photographs that were taken for technical reasons. Typic what? A lot of them were done in a very regularized way. Yes, with first grade quality. And the major problem is at some point it's too expensive to keep them, so they shred them or, you know. And so, you know, anybody here who's a historian has worked in archives knows that the miracle is if it, you could only get them to forget about their, what they own for 100 years. I just had two other sorry, sure. random comments. The other comment I had was that. If you didn't do Pentecostal churches, right. just pick anything. Move yes. to the building next door of one. Yeah. And then go out and record all buildings like that building. Right. You would come up with a similar and equally provocative. Experience. No, I think not. I think actually taste matters. I think that I have pretty good taste. Uh, maybe not superb, but not bad. I mean, my trick was most people who, I mean, including Vergara, do not worry about Pentecostal theology. They just like the pictures. They just think it's, they get off on the religiosity. But do they know anything about the history of Pentecostalism? Very little. Do they care about the theology? Very little. I think, I mean, that's why I find Tom Roma's pictures a little bit too much. You know, yes, it's nice that they're rolling their eyes back and they're getting, the, feeling the spirit. But I think it, they, we owe those people more than that. Um, and it may turn out that the stores next to the buildings next to the churches have an interesting story. And maybe it's better. But my intuitions are no. But you might be right. Well, I think my thought was slightly, just slightly different, and I, yeah. I'm not meaning this to be skeptical in no, any no. way. Yeah. Uh, I'm just saying that one of the beauties of this is yeah. I could go to Greek Revival homes. Yes. And in all the Greek Revival homes. I could go to right. homes made with a certain kind of pattern or brick or made by, right. and the environment is filled with an infinite right. number of these patterns. And the problem is to choose examples that allow for rich elaboration. Hmm. And it depends on your own skills. I mean, I cannot do what an architect will do, you know, who sees the world entirely differently. You know, I mean, acutely aware of when they have foam columns rather than, you know, real columns, all right? And all that stuff. But so, but I think that, so it's a question, and why in the world was I interested in that religious stuff? I'd written a book on um, religious figures as model entrepreneurs. The first chapter was on Augustine, the second chapter was on Moses, all right? I got a grant for that too, which is why, I mean, the point is that I was acutely aware there that if you take the theology seriously as such you learn a lot not that you have to believe anything but if you take it seriously you go very far and that was my that was my discovery in other words if i understood why augustine did what he did i could understand things about decision making that were illuminating now do i do I think he really ha heard some, uh, some tree talking to him? You know, in the backyard when he said, you know, tree said, take it and read and opened up the book and pointed? Or that, uh, that what's his name, uh, had a flash of life and fell off the donkey, Paul? Who cares? But you know, I'm a Jew from Brooklyn. So it doesn't matter to me. But I mean, you know, for Christians, it's obvious, for certain kinds of Christians, it's a very important issue. But as a scholar, what matters is to take those events as serious accounts which then are illuminating. And that's what really is wonderful. Um, but I think your point is very well taken. I mean, I don't think that I know what's interesting. I don't know. You know, I mean, you know, a good Marxist probably could take the, uh, you know, the garbage on the street and convert it to a good story. But uh, probably the good Marxist is Karl. And you know the rest don't do as well. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you for your for your presentation. The lecture was very impressive, <clears throat> especially as as the various recordings and uh, pictures also offer a window on the on the organizations of the spaces that you're looking into, like you know the organization of the of the of the Pentecostalist meeting house. Yeah. Uh, but my question is. Uh, 
the great 19th century surveys of cities, uh, which this makes me in a way think of also, uh, had a very particular motivation, a particular purpose, which is to map you know, the proletariat and understand how it, how it could be in a way. How you could control the uh, disease, the source of disease. Right, exactly. Right. How, how then yeah. further would be normalized afterwards, etc. So I was wondering if, if what your particular motivations here, from uh, from an outsider perspective, it seems that it's, uh, it is motivated by the, the fleetingness of, of Los Angeles as an urban... Los Angeles is the least freaky place. It's very ordinary. Yeah, like I mean, Boston seems weird to me. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, uh, 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 the whole thing of uh, uh, Los Angeles exceptionalism strikes me as unlikely to get you very far. But let's me go back more seriously to your remark. Well, the question is, what, what is, what is driving you? What is your propelling you forward? What well, propels me forward? It's a good question. Why in the world are I be interested in such a thing? Um, I, one of the things is it was so interesting visually. Second of all, there were so many of them. And third, I had a feeling I knew I could do something with it. And those don't sound like, like cleaning up the idiots in the world or you know, solving problems. And maybe I do have some nefarious purposes, but I suspect a lot of it has to do with, um, and also it was distant from me. I mean, I've gone, for example, where I live in Los Angeles, there's lots of synagogues, which are not storefront synagogues, uh, but there are, uh, you know, and, you know, essentially four, four Jews have five synagogues because, you know, they have one they wouldn't go to. But the point is that, uh, the, the, the basic, the point is that there is sectarianism there, but they don't wear it in the same way. They don't, it doesn't quite uh, evidence it in the same way, all right? Uh, but there is stuff like that. Uh, and by the way, it wasn't only Pentecostal churches. Storefront churches include lots that are not Pentecostal. Uh, and I, I, they're, they're part of my large sample. Uh, you know, but Pentecostalism is just very rich with sectarianism. That's what makes it so wonderful. Uh, it starts out as one movement, and then it gets racially sec and then it has arguments about whether it's the first or the, the second or third, um, uh, what is it, you know, um, Salvation. I mean, the, the whole bunch of interesting issues would split them up, and uh, and and therefore it says, for example, when it says read the Bible, all right, you know, you'll see all that. Why do they say read the Bible? Because you're not supposed to listen to the church. You're supposed to read the Bible, but it's more than that. If they have, if they say something in Spanish or English, there's always some argument that they're having. And I think I've always been fascinated by Protestant sectarianism. But why? Because I, I never understood it. Yes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, seems, can I make just a comment? Yes. On what you shared with us tonight, which I've enjoyed very, very much. When I last saw you here in MIT, we were concerned with the possibility of models of urban phenomena right. and the great difficulties of operating those in any way that would give you a predictive description of the conditions that a city needs to meet right. in order to perform well. And it seems to be that you're exactly on that same track, only you move in the other direction. You said, I want to enable those who would model how the late 20th century city worked to create plausible accounts of the data I give of what the city was doing well and what it was not doing. Let me see if I understand you. The change in my work is when I'm doing field work, and remember, I didn't always do field work most of my life, all right? Most of my I sat in my office. Yeah, at best. Mostly up here. But, you know, and then I would go to the library to confirm it. But the point is, this is a very different life I lead now. I mean, I don't feel like reading most of the time. What I want to do is go out and look. I go read because I want to understand something. You know, but it's a very, right, it's, it's, it's a very big change. Uh, it's not that my previous work wasn't empirical, it was very empirical to my mind, but this is driven by the world. 
you know, it's what it, the world takes hold of me. Does that say? And it's very powerful. I mean, the, the example is my walking around Boston this morning since I got off the plane. Uh, and I used to live here, but I never walked around. I never saw anything. And no one else I did knew either did much of it as far as I know. They must have, maybe they were closet uh, viewers, but they never mentioned it. But the point was that it was so interesting to look at. First of all, I had new eyes, right? Because, you know, I've seen other places. And, you know, it was just, it, the world hit me, and I, I don't know what to do with it now. And you can say, come on, this is just Boston, probably the most studied, academically studied city in America. All right? But maybe other than Chicago. And, but it was remarkable what I saw. And it will force me to think again, and I probably will have to come back and do a whole bunch of photographing and thinking, and probably write things on brick and some other things. And also, the most interesting phenomenon is the cheek by jowlness of it. It's also in Los Angeles. Uh, the most interesting is how housing and industry are cheek by jowl all over. If your big companies know, but if smaller factories and so forth historically, you have an enormous amount of housing and factories across the street from each other and around each other. And I don't know if everybody notices that here, but it was really striking to me today. And so, yes, you're right. You're deeply right. I mean, I just, I, the best thing in my life is to go out and do field work. Step. Right. And say, how would a designer take advantage of your insights and your taxonomies? Two points. One, I think it really does say that it go, it's worth going to look. You know, the usual line about architects is they go traveling with their cameras and bring home slides. You know, and um, and they look. You know, they're looking all the time, and you know, at least you know, at least the architects I used to know. Um, and, but I think, it, so there's one important thing that you really need to go look. You can't read books. Books and pictures will teach you nothing unless you get hit in the face, I would maintain. They teach you a lot, but they don't teach you the deep things, all right? So that's one remark, which is not, the, uh, not what you asked. But, uh, I mean, to say that is probably not surprising to professors of design. You know, the students, that's what you, you tell them, go do field work. Um, the other point is that if I'm lucky, what I do is make it impossible for people not to see things. Usually after I've shown them, I put up an exhibit of something, like the storefront churches. The typical remark I get is, my, they said, my God, now they're everywhere. Because you've systematically learned not to see things. And once you are, sort of they become topical, What's the word? There's a word that they use, topic, um, salient, but there's a nicer word than that. Essentially, when they become topics for discussion, people then start seeing things. And one of the major purposes of the work I do is to make people see things that are, I mean, I told you I'm photo photographing mosses, you know, you know, in the cracks. And I have a feeling it might be interesting, but it might not be. I haven't found a useful botanist yet. Uh, there's lots of people, by the way, if you care about something called roadside ecology, where people worry about um, you know, what happens in roads, and there's lots of money for it. But this is in cities. Uh, you know, and I found one essay on mosses in cities. But once people hear about this, they can't help but see. Especially if I have something interesting to say, which at the moment I don't. Does that answer a little bit? I mean, I don't, in other words, I don't know if anything I say is so important as the fact that it's there, that's unavoidable. You know, it's just unavoidable. Um, or when I talk about store for, um, worship, uh, it doesn't, there's nothing profound there, it's just that people don't, take it seriously, if that's what I mean. You know, they sort of dismiss it, unless they're a professor of religion or a believer. But there's other places, ways to take it seriously. Um, I think 
that's the most useful thing. Or that you see, the other way to put this is that what you have to learn as a designer is that things just don't happen. They're happening for a set of usually political, sociological, economic reasons. And there, there's a reason why the storefront churches are where they are. And there's a story behind that. And so it's not just things happen, they happen in a coherent way, in a meaningful way. And that changes things, because then it becomes a linked set of motives and what you see and how it works are related. And that seems to be a deeply important thing for people who do, do design. They know this, sort of. They're not stupid. It's just not part of their bread and butter way of thinking in general. That's why city planners and designers are often so very different. Anything? One, one final yeah. thought. What you're doing for us is saying you must attend to a greater number of conditions than the ordinary man. Right. You've got to be reasonably flat in your priorities to give this to Because many of them, they could be the seeds of what could be the next. Right. So it's that enlarging yes. number of conditions to which you attach respect. The gentleman over there who was saying to me, well, could you do it with everything? I think it's not true that everything counts. But the idea is to learn a few more things. I mean, you can't tell people everything counts because that's just disastrous. You know, that's, that's the kind of advice that, that's paralyzing. But to give them more things that count is just amazing. And if you choose the things with some care, you know, it could be this Morse idea is ridiculous and stupid, you know, that I really can't go any place with it. Uh, but we'll see. And the sound stuff I don't think will be stupid. But, you know, it might turn out not to be productive. It's an empirical, it's an intellectual question. Can you make something of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 my thing I'm right now thinking about is what does it sound like to be in your apartment with traffic outside and how you don't hear it? Where I live, there's always accidents. And most of the time, you hear a crash, you don't do anything, you go on, you know, after a while. It's interesting. Um, I don't know what I'm talking about here, but hopefully in a year I will. My friends who do sound design and sound editing for films, they're very articulate about using sound. They know exactly what they want. Not exactly, but you know, for them, it's, it's, a, it's a vocabulary rich, laden thing. But, and, and their thing is to create an ordinary feeling. You know what I mean? They're trying, remember, their problem is there is no good ordinary sound to be recorded. They have to put it all in because the background sound is never right. You know, the background sound in the, in the, in the, in the uh, studio or even on, on, uh, on stage, they're always they're completely artificial about it. And, uh, and think of lighting in theater, right? Where it's all, you know, let there be light. Each, each lighting designer is like God. There were some questions. Thatcher, sure. did you have a question before? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I was I was going to ask you. Know, I, I think you sort of were able to answer, but I was I, I was going to ask about your comment when you said you know perhaps 800 makes a better argument than 600. What what is your argument? But it, it sounds like your argument is this exists. Um, you give it to the future. To, well, no, no. There's oh, no, that was a joke, partially. Probably yeah. I could have stopped at 600. All right. Uh, I could have stopped at 100, I know that. And I could have, could I have stopped at 400? Probably, all right? But there were questions of represent representativeness. I had, it wasn't on 400, but I needed some other parts of the city. I had to feel like I was running out of interesting cases. I mean, I've gone to about 40 um, clothes manufacturers in Los Angeles, you know, where they do sewing or cutting, maybe more, all right? At some point, it doesn't seem like I'm going to learn any more. I went to maybe, 
Let me give you another example. I went to one very large foundry where they make things like for Saturn rockets, the the round parts, the thing that holds it, the, the bands and so forth. And that's very high purity metal, you know, you can imagine. And it has the biggest, you know, forge in the West Coast or maybe in the world and whatnot. And it might be go nice to go to another one, but one's enough probably of that. On the other hand, there is a foundry in downtown Los Angeles, which is my favorite one, called AlphaCast. And what do they make? They make things like light poles. You know, and those decorated things out of cast aluminum and clay. Right? And I'm convinced that what I need to do there is not go to other foundries, but study this one better, more. Because the men there, first of all, they know me finally. You know, they're used to this guy who keeps showing up. But they, they're friendly and they work together and they, you know, it's a very coordinated business. You know, I don't know if you know that many kinds of work are, are really quite dangerous. For example, working at the ports is extremely dangerous because all you need to do is have a, uh, a um, container fall on you. Splat, all right? And this happens. So um, it's, um, uh, so let me give an example of that. It, I, I had a guy who took me to the ports. He was a high guy in the ILWU, International Longshore Workers, Longshore and Warehouse Workers Union, which is the West Coast Union. It's much less corrupt than the East Coast one. All right, Harry Bridges, you ever hear of him? Uh, he, was, he, he, he was an Australian guy, he was a communist. You can imagine how popular he was at a certain time. He was the leader, all right? And worth knowing about. And so, so um, Dominic took me around. Dominic's father was the founder, one of the founders of the union, I'm told. And Dominic is about 72. He still works at the port. He's also a professor at a local community college. And so we went to uh, about seven different kinds of ships. Roll on, roll off, uh, so-called bulk loaders. I could give you the names of all these, all right? And he wanted me to see it. Now, you know, he had his own agenda. He wanted me to show the men at work and be sympathetic to them. But I come from the background where that's free. So that wasn't, he didn't have to work on me. But, um, and so I was able to go to, you know, seven or eight sites. Um, should I go to more? Is a question. I don't think so. All right, but it might be interesting. But I'm not going to, because it was hard to get access. But I went to every main kind of ship. You know, freight ship from container ships. Oh, I, let me show you this, with just for the just to brag. Um, oh God, the problem with all this stuff is that we've worked so hard at producing this that I can't find it. Let me get rid of some of these. I want to show you uh, one other thing. Yeah. These are photographs I took. Oh, where are they? Oh God, come on. Are they here? No. Yeah. These photographs here are, you see them in the poster. This is a couple actually. They met in the union hiring hall. All right. And they are called front men, the things coming off the ship. This is looking into the hold of a ship. This is uh, some of the documents that go on. This is, I was, I was up a 10 story high in a crane. That's my bragging. And it's a woman doing it. She's, she's a crane operator. And then you ask how'd she get to be a crane operator, there's a story. Um, these guys love their work. They're really terrific at stowing and unstowing things. They really like doing their work. I, I mean, I met them and talked to them. Um, yeah, what's his name? Oh, I forgot his name. I met him, Sam. I kept meeting him at various, diff having different jobs. When they load up a ship, the idea is you have to make it sort of uniform, otherwise the ship will tilt, and, which is not what you want. Uh, this is uh, the set of uh, assignments at a uh, Disney, at uh, a Disney crew boat. You know, at a Disney cruise boat. And each of the, each of the uh, different um, kinds of uh, luggage, different groups of luggage has a different Disney figure associated with it. Um, this is another one. This is guy has an ILWU, um, you know, um, tattoo. And this is people waiting to find jobs, all right? So 
I don't think I would learn more by doing many more photographs, but I could have a lot, I could, you know, do much more. Have you ever read a, a book by Alan Sekula called Fish Story? Um, Sekula is something of a, let's call him a Marxist, and a, and a terrific photographer. And you ought to read it. It's all about essentially how the destruction of the, of essentially the, the ordinary, the old labor ways destroys a certain society. Very smart man. A little bit too much for me, but that doesn't matter. You know, but the photographs are so gorgeous, it gets in the way. You know, it's someone who's, you, if the photographs are too gorgeous, it's hard to think of people as being victimized. But that's another problem. But I do recommend it if you want to see something like that. But my purpose was not to do the fish story. My picture purpose was to show the context in which people did their work. Um, I was less concerned about worrying about whether they're, they're victimized or not. Um, I don't know why. I just, that doesn't seem to me where I can do any good. I just don't have the kind of personality, the right, you need a certain kind of righteousness when you start doing that. You know, I'm on the right side of the good. I tend, to, not that I think that, uh, you know, that Hitler, there's a good thing to be said for Hitler or for, uh, you know, for the head of GM, but, um, but I, I just don't have that kind of personality other people do and they're much better at it. More questions, please? Yes? Yeah, I'm trained as a, I'm trained as a, I have a, I have a canonical management education as a scientist. Right. And this, a different sort of empiricism shows in your books. I, I don't mean the indexing, but it's, it's really specific. I mean, when you say you have to go to these places, they exist at the periphery when, the, you know, when you're talking about the, the power station. Yeah. And you sort of, if, if you were to map them, you know, sort of back, you would emerge of how so yeah, right, right. Like that. right. So that, that's a, an empiricism that's embedded in your work. And you mentioned Diderot and yeah. Marvel, and I, um, I'm curious about what you think of uh, some other Frenchmen who uh, write about critical theory and everyday urbanism in critical theory, and I wonder what your views are on that, because that's, that's essentially non-empirical. It's, I mean... No, it's critical and it's theoretical. It's right. meant to be empirical. It's meant to draw from examples and so forth. But it's but it's. I, um, do you think they draw from examples? I'm not. Let me put it this way. Here's your problem with me. I mean, this is this is just being honest. It's really terrible to admit. I was reading Derrida and all those people when they were in French and only a little bit in English because my friends, I had friends in French departments who told me, to, "Oh, go read this guy," and I was reading and I was teaching and reading. Um, Heidegger before it became as popular as it is. Once it became popular, you know, in the sort of the, the postmodernist line, I couldn't read the stuff. Which doesn't mean I just don't have the stomach for it. Um, I don't have the style that's required. I mean, I just don't have, I'm not built that way. Um, when I read Heidegger, I read him in a very unromanticized way, uh, in a fairly technical way. Um, what I learned from the, um, I mean, I learned something from Derrida, but not very much compared to what most people seem to have learned. So, but I think you have a deep question that's, that's been on my mind, and anybody who has an answer, you know, would be grateful for it. Why in the world these three Frenchmen, I keep mentioning, it's not like I spend my life, you know, where I care only for Frenchmen, but why Diderot, Marville, and Atche, right? And I asked a friend of mine, um, who is who's the one who got me to read Der Derrida. This is in the seventy. In the he got me to read Derrida in, in like the mid seventies. All right, before it was you know it was popular in literature, but it wasn't. Gatry Spivak's book hadn't come out and things like that. And um, he said, well, it's partially the the, the the Frenchmen are the great systematizers, you know, and the very the rationality of it you know, the systematic organization. And maybe that's true, all right? Now, how that connects with this other thread is an interesting question. And of course, there could be several threads. I mean, there's also a, a tradition in France of, uh, of um, fantastic thinking. But I've chosen these particular, you know, figures. So maybe I've chosen one thread 
in French thought. But I don't, uh, but I'm not answering a question, I know that, but I don't have anything smart to say about it. Um, but I was, but I was sort of struck one day, I said, what am I doing with these French guys? You know, and it's because they served my purpose. But then you say, well, you know, this is not exactly uh, an abstract tradition. These are people who know about each other, historically. And so it's an interesting question. Yes? It seems that the branches sort of acquired it. I'm not sure of this, but if in the past they, they knew each other, and maybe sort of the, 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 the sensibility spread more into different streams of thought, it doesn't seem to sort of happen now where this sort of empirical work and sort of other you know, presentations we've seen in this series that are empirical uh, don't seem to borrow from there and um, from where? From, from say critical theory and I, I, I don't, I'm not suggesting that they should. What I'm interested in knowing is what what your view on, on the intelligence of, of those theories are. Well, I ask is, you, can, I, can they feed into into sort of Oh sure. No, no first of all, there's a there's a whole bunch of people who um um who you know there's a book called uh, by um oh god she's married to a photographer, she's a uh, literary critic. Um the cover has a picture of her naked, um, taken by her husband. Uh, oh God, I can't think of her name. She's, I think she's at Iowa or something. She's a well-known feminist critic, all right? And it, there are people who do worry about this. Remember, there's, there's oh, look, here's, what, here's the answer to you, which is sort of the blunt thing. There's Susan Zontag. There's uh, Bach, who writes about you know photography. There's um, what's his name? Um, has a whole book on photography. The sociologist Bourdieu. There's a whole. If you want the French, there's a whole bunch of these Frenchmen who do this. Why don't I quote from them? You might ask, right? It doesn't help me think. All right. Now, and you could say, well, uh, maybe you 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 should. What is your? If, they don't if help me do my problem, work. Right, right. But then, what is behind that rejection? Or well, I don't know. I mean, sort of like asking a lady who's crossing the street, why doesn't she want someone to help him, help her? Um, no, because it's obviously. I mean, I'm no, no. I think it's, it's a hundred. It's a good hundred dollar question. Um, and maybe not everybody is concerned, but you know we know what's going on intellectually. There's a whole bunch of people who are concerned about postmodern photography. There's a whole bunch of people who do read those people. All right, and you know, photographer. I mean, photographic criticism is imbued with discussions of about and and Susan Zontag and um, and and uh, and in fact, this book, which I can't remember the title of, is. Is, is, is amusing on these kinds of things. Um, and there must be people who are very much influenced by it. Because um, I'm not a real photographer. That's the point. I just take pictures. Real photographers, look, the, what I mean by photographer is someone who is either part of an art tradition or a photojournalistic tradition or maybe a commercial tradition. At best, I'm part of a documentation tradition. All right, but most of we call the documentation photographers have been elevated to artists. Etche is an artist. Marville is an artist. You know, I mean, there's no there's no second-rate documentary photographers, as far as one can tell. The ones that are written about who do documentation are great artists. I mean, you know, buy this thing. I can't. I'm not smart enough to handle that stuff. I don't know what to do with it. All right. I mean, I can like the photographs, but I'm not smart about what's a great artist. I mean, yes, I know that, you know, Shelley Coe is a great artist, but I don't need, we're not talking about that. And, you know, but I mean, it's a fair question to ask. But insofar as these, you have to go, who would I look at? Um, let me see. Well, I mean, Sekula is a perfect example of writing with a Marxist tone. 
And there must be a whole bunch of people, photographers who now write with a, you know, with a postmodernist uh, Frenchy tone. I just don't keep up with it because I can't read it. I don't have the brain for it. Um, it the, the words uh, go right before my eyes. I mean, now maybe I'm becoming an old man. You know, that's always a possibility. I am becoming an old man, but I mean, maybe I'm, you know, losing it. Um, but I think what John DeMoncho asked me was a serious remark. When I said I get happy, you know, going out in the field, <laughs> somewhere along the line, I lost my interest in that stuff. I mean, I, I was reading an article in, in Technology and Culture, which is the Society of History of Technology magazine, a marvelous article about um, scanning, tun scanning tunnel microscopy and as an instrumental community. And all I could think of, as, which was wonderful stuff, but I said, oh my god, they're having this argument internal to the discipline about what instrumental community is and who's going to get points and will it be Peter Gallison or will it be Jed Buckwald, or, you know, or people I know, all of whom are very well thought of, but each one of them wants to be on top, right? You know, the major rule is the more famous they are, the, the more they feel like they're under-recognized. If you don't know that, that's an important principle. And I don't care. I mean, I'll be honest with you, I just think of this as all, this doesn't do me any good. Now that is, to admit that as a professor is really sinful, is, you know, but I don't, I mean, it won't help me. What I want to know is how the industry works. I want to, I'll read Phil Scranton, who writes about industrial, industry and cities, or I'll read my colleague, um, uh, Greg Heiss. I mean, I read his stuff religiously, even though he's a friend. Because, or that's a joke, but you know, because I learn how to think about things. So, yes. I think that's a good place to Yeah, end. fine. All right, I mean, all right, good. Is that okay? Yeah. Good. All right, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.